Good evening, class. Uh, I hope uh, you are uh, you are all well this time as we uh, continue with our um, lecture. Hopefully, this lecture is uh, going to be the the last. But the lecture or module seven, I'm going to uh, send that to you for further reading. But it will be in uh, format. No? So this recorded lecture I'm going to give you is actually uh, only up to module six. So that our exam also, uh, after this module, I'm going to give you another week to prepare for the exam, which I'm going to send you again uh, for to be answered. And by the way, I would like to uh, remind the class that next week will be the uh, deadline for the movie review that I have assigned to you. The, the answers to all the questions. I hope you are done by this time. And then uh, submit that uh, uh, by, uh, by group. No? In other words, it's a group output. I hope that uh, you are going to really specify the members of your group and try to uh, uh, identify them so that in the grading, I wouldn't be finding it difficult to uh, credit where the credit is due. No, Be sure to identify very well so that in giving you the grades, uh, that will also accrue to whoever person is listed in your group. Remember, that is a group output. Then answers to all guide questions should be very clear and should follow all instructions I have given to you last time. No? So we have uh, done the lecture already on uh, module, module 4, Module 5. And then the exam uh, after this will be from Module 4 to Module 6. Okay, <laughs> That will be the coverage of, of the exam. So please prepare because uh, I'm going to just the same. I'm, I'm going to just follow the same procedure as I have given to you last time. And uh, I'm, get, I'm going to give you a take home exam, no problem. Huh? Then give you a take home exam, giving you about 24 hours to answer everything and return the uh, uh, and answers to the question within within 24 hours. No, so it's a take home exam. So. Uh, you don't uh, you don't need to be pressured about the question will be turned off after uh, one or two hours but this time it's a take-home exam you can uh, answer at your own convenience okay so this module actually uh, involves or would deal on something that is almost like a continuation of module 5 now, the module 5 is on game theory and pricing decisions. Now, the game theory part there is just a little bit of like scratch from the surface of what game theory is all about. Because in advanced, uh, in a graduate uh, uh, course in economics, there is really a separate uh, subject on game theory or theory of games and economic behavior. No, it's a separate uh, uh, one semester course. So that, uh, that that one I have introduced to you, hopefully would give an idea in terms of what game theory is all about. There is more, or there's a lot of things in game theory, no? if you look at literatures this time. So uh, uh, game theory also, and how it affects economic behavior is considered by modern economists as the most active part in microeconomics. It's the most active part. That means to say uh, the economics as uh, really seen in this, uh, in this time of the century is really no longer following the basic assumptions of all the four types of market structure, but it's actually a combination of everything, but it's more of game theoretic economics. No? Now, that's why in module six, in this module, 
we will introduce you some of the things that are uh, impacted by the theory of games. Now, one of this is on, the, on this particular module in module six, which is an introductory part to the economics of information. No? Now, one of the things that makes economic relationships and transactions game theoretic it's because one is there is violative uh, already uh, introduction of being able or really relax relaxation of the assumption of perfect information now in real situation in real situation in the market there is no such thing as perfect information some informations are are divulged but especially in the very intense competition or competitive situation, there will be some information that will be withheld. Now, this particular, uh, this particular, say, uh, module will give us an idea in terms of what are the what are the different strategies that can help us incentivize the divulging of information that will make economic transaction more transparent and or we call it more asymmetric. Okay, more asymmetric, Bec uh, more more symmetric rather, not asymmetric, more symmetric. Now, so this one, this module actually, uh, as I have said, departs from the very basic assumption in purely competitive market or even in a little bit in, in the monopolistic market where there is free flowing of information from uh, the buyer and the seller, okay? So in other words, what the buyer knows, the seller knows also. So that is perfect information. But here we relax that assumption. We kind of uh, make things more realistic in terms of like uh, assuming that there is imperfect information, information, which is actually the case in real business situation. There are informations that are withheld, withheld, and there are information that is deliberately uh, divulged, but not entirely. No, it's it's really business. You know how how business operates. There are things that you need to be, uh, you need to be, you know, you need to uh, be more sort of secretive. You need to withhold because of business reason, and that's entirely valid. No, but. The transaction between buyer and seller would somehow allow certain degree of, you know, uh, um, uh, opening or transparency that would allow also say uh, that would allow free flow or like the exchange process to happen. That is what we mean by, or that is what we call as, there is market change. Okay, so we now have to relax these assumptions. And incorporate our analysis in the effects of uncertainty and imperfect information okay so in this in this module we focus our analysis of the market in terms of market situation under uncertainty of information and then market situation under risk risky situation so firstly we attempt we will attempt to describe what do we really mean by uncertainty and examine its impact on consumer behavior and then also we the next thing is then we would like to make a quick tour on some of the ways by which managers can cope with risk also what are what when we say risk decision making what do we mean what do we exactly mean by that no and then finally down the line we uh, uh, introduce some of the strategies or concepts that will address important implications of uncertainty on essential uh, processes of the market including other markets okay so there is market for inputs market for finished goods or something like that no so that will be the scope or the coverage of this module okay first thing in in, in trying to uh, like uh, uh, in trying to make a, the first step in really understanding the, the uncertainty of the market. Now, we would uh, rewind a little bit our understanding 
Okay, backtrack a little bit at our understanding. <coughs> and use a specific statistical tool, okay, that is also very powerful in being able to minimize risk and have some, have some uh, a bit of understanding in terms of the possible benefit in the entire market transactions. In other words, we will review our, our basic knowledge on the understanding of mean and variance. Okay, so we will use this concept very simplistic, but better in terms of being able to uh, help us decide which one is optimal in terms of decision or uh, uh, decision making challenges that is confronting us, decision makers. No? So, the easiest way to summarize, we mean mean variance, the easiest way to summarize the information about uncertain outcome is to use the statistical concept of mean and variance. No? So, there is uncertainty. There is also what we call as uh, uh, like the basis of decision. So we all all revolves around the issue of variance, mean and variance of a random variable. Now, what are random variables? Now, in we in the decision, decision making, managerial decision making, we are always confronted with various random variables. That is the object of our decision. Now, what are random variables in economics? What are, what are some of the random variables that that may represent you know, something that is, or that may become an object of our decision? One is profit. Okay, we consider profit as a random variable. Why? Because we do not have control of the entire control of profit level. We also yes uh, consider sales as a random variable. Okay, consumers' income as a random variable. Price of output and even price of input. And others. These are random variables. No? In other words, and these are also variables that have been recurring or confronting us, and we made some decisions that will impact on these different kinds of random variables. Now let's take for that. Let's take for example any of those uh, random variables mentioned and try to see how we are going to go about dealing and managing all these random variables when we are confronted with specific decision. First, we use the concept of mean and variance analysis. Okay? Now, when we say mean, we mean expected value of a random variable. No? Expected value or the mathematical expectation of a random variable. Okay? It is defined as the sum of the probabilities of the different outcomes which will occur times the resulting payoff okay there are there are uh, uh, say for example uh, probabilities of occurrence okay there is probability of occurrence and that probability of occurrence is also associated with certain payoff if for example if it will not rain okay what is the probability that it will not rain so there is a probability <coughs> and then what is going to be your sales if it will rain so there is also a probability or there is also a value sales value if, if it's going to rain and what is the probability of the uh, happening or what is the probability that rain is going to happen now that is the the product of the two becomes the mathematical expectation or the expected value of that random variable given the probability of occurrence now if we are confronted with a specific decision, both sides of the possibilities we are going to deal with. That means the, the expected value of a random variable or a certain occurrence is actually the, the summation of all expected value, okay? Or in, in statistics, you have summation QI, summation QI, XI where i ranges from 1 to n now if you expand that expression it will be like this no? expected value of x or xi is actually equal to all possibilities all possibility possible uh, occurrences you sum that up you have each each occurrence each occurrence you uh, kind of multiply that by the probability of occurrence qi and so on uh, Q, uh, X2, occurrence number two, 
times probability of occurrence uh, for two, for that particular event happening plus and so on up to you have the uh, random variable probability as I shall say uh, the event that is xn okay happening times the probability of that of xn or qn and then you simplify the expression and add them the resulting the resulting uh, <coughs> product or sum becomes the expected value or simply of that random variable no? so uh, associated by certain degree of uncertainty or probability of occurrence no? now taking for example a a uh, a uh, an experiment of rolling a die no? we roll a die so how many sides does a die has it has six sides no? six sides so that means to say if we represent for example uh say one side as the probability of occurrence for one side is p1 p2 p3 and so on i mean uh, occurrence of the probability of the of one side like for example the payoff of one side is p1 p2 and so on now the probability of occurrence of that of one side is one six because that is one over six okay therefore if for example the value of one event xi value of one event happening is actually equal to for example one peso if there is for example if this is uh side two side three up to side six side one the if you put for example uh one peso there and side two you have also uh, one peso there and so on and then you multiply that you multiply each by its level of probability and add them all together you get 350 3 pesos and 60 centavos as the what the expected value okay now that is the that is that is the short I mean uh, the systematic way of solving for the possible benefit given a uh, of possible benefit of that particular event happening given a uh, a, a situation where it is under uh, uncertainty or imperfect information now and then you have there 350 as the expected value for any particular side of the ano uh, any particular side of the say for example uh, die uh, happening so you mean to say you roll a die between one to six no? you roll in Russia, then you get an expected value of uh, three pesos and 15 tabos any particular event by our animal piece of piece until uh, uh, rolling down the uh, sixth term okay now that is the expected value now we go to another measure which is the variance okay the variance remember the expected value is the sum of the I uh, know is the sum of the oh no it's the mean of that event happening it being mathematical expectation or the expected value is the is considered as the mean no now the mean provides information about the average value of random variable average value of the random variable okay given the probability of occurrence no information about the, the degree of risk is given in this particular in this particular uh, say uh, the situation if you can <coughs> if you are only going to compute for the mean okay now <coughs> consider the following <coughs> we take for example <coughs> we take these two examples so that you would have a better appreciation of the usefulness of mean and delimitation of mean okay so consider the following example the first example is option one there are two sides of the coin no? you flip an unbiased coin okay now in flipping the coin if you if it comes up heads okay you will receive one peso if it comes up tail you will pay one peso okay remember kung head upon tossing the coin is it, be, it will come up you receive one peso if it turns out to be tail 
you will pay one peso. So the question is, what is the mean value of, uh, for example, one side happening given and I'm given a this particular experiment of uh, flipping a coin and bias coin two times. Okay. So the other one is flipping a coin. Okay, the same thing. Flipping a coin when it comes up head, you will receive ten pesos. But if it comes up what? If it comes up tail, you will pay one peso. Ten pesos. One is you only pay you only receive one peso. The other one is ten pesos. The other one is one peso you pay, and then the other one you also pay ten pesos. What is the difference in terms of ex, uh, expected value? The difference is nothing. In other words, the when you look at expected value, okay, when you look at expected value, the expected value of any particular event with a particular payoff with a, the same level of probability, the mathematical expectation would be the same. Okay. In other words, there is 50-50 chance of the coin that will land as head. Thus, the expected value is equal to or option one is zero, and then option two is also a zero okay it cancels out okay now that is the the, the expected value that is the first thing that we look at in terms of uh, deciding for uh, situations or happening out actually say the 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 probability of occurring or occurrence of, the, of a particular event given the uh, level of risk or the level of probability of, uh, associated no? now let's uh, using the same example let's proceed a little further okay how about if we compute for the variance of the two okay the most common measure of risk is variance okay mathematical ex expectation or expected value is just trying to compute for the average payoff okay of that particular event happening okay but if we proceed a little further if we compute for the variance of that particular event that is already something different okay the the variance is commonly represented by the measures of risk or commonly associated with the measures of risk okay the variance could be differences in payoff or differences in uh, in uh, in expected benefit for example now the variance which depends especially on the deviations of possible outcomes from the mean what is the deviation of mean value what is the deviation that is the 10 and the and the one peso now the variance of a random variable is the sum no? the variance of a random variable Okay. The variance of a random variable is the sum of the probabilities that different outcomes will occur times the square deviation from the mean or random variable. Okay, Or in our statistics, it is actually the summation of you have, you have the uh, x minus mu or the expected value square, okay, square times what the probability of occurrence of that particular event so in other words you are going to square the deviation from the expected value for every event you square the deviation of the expected value for that uh, they square the the, ex, the the deviation from the expected value of any particular event times the probability of that event happening is actually uh, equal to one entry, okay, the variance of that particular event given that given that particular experiment, okay. So let's take for example the the situation. Now you have formally the formula for a variance is you have x minus mu or you have here x minus expected value x square and then times the probability of x one, okay x1 minus expected value x is square times the probability of the you have x1 happening you add because it is a summation summation qi 
times xi minus expected value times, I will say, square, and then do that, do that up to the uh, xn level, okay? x minus mu square times the probability and plus xn uh or shall I say xn what uh xn minus expected value square times qn okay in other words this is you are simply in this case you are simply squaring you get the square of the deviations from the expected value Okay, square is getting the difference, no? The, you square the deviation from the expected value. What is the purpose of squaring the deviation? So that you will do away with negative number, okay? So that you can get exactly the deviations from the mean and the level of probability, and that, that gives you the, the variance, that gives you the level of risk that is associated for that particular event happening okay and then well straightforward if we compute for the standard deviation it's simply the square root of the variance okay you extract the square root of the variance now that you have done it's just a, a refinement of the variance but the variance can already give us an idea in terms of which one is more preferable given the expected value of that event happening okay just like, for example, this one. Take, take note of the first experiment that we have, or we had a while ago, on coin tossing experiment. Okay, the expected value that we compute is actually zero between option one and option two. But if we proceed to the variance, although the the expected benefit is actually equal to zero, because each one cancels out. Now. If we compute for the variance, a different picture emerges. Okay, you have option one. If we perform the the operation, x minus mu because the mean value is zero, x minus zero, square that. This this one is not two. No, it is square times one half because two sides of the coin, 0.5 and probability of occurrence. Okay, a plus. Okay, you have one half minus. Why minus? Okay, why minus? Because you pay when it is a head, no? And can you when it is a tail? This one, okay, this part here, it's positive because you receive money kung head ang, mulab, ang lalabas. But this one, it's negative because you pay one peso pag tail ang lalabas, okay? So this one, uh, minus zero square. So that means to say, if you... If you add them, okay, perform the operation, the variance is actually 1, okay? The variance actually is, is 1 because that is because the, the payoff is only equal to 1. But look at the other example. If the, if the value, okay, if, if the occurrence, if, if head, but if a head comes up in the coin tossing, the other experiment is you pay or you receive 10 pesos. This one. But when you flip the second time and tail comes up, you pay 10 pesos. Simplifying that expression, the variance is equal to 100. Can you see the difference? Okay. Do you see the difference? If variance is associated with the risk, risk level of, the, of that particular experiment, which one is more risky? It's the second experiment because the variance is higher. You will incur if it is, if this variance is <laughs> equivalent to like loss level, you will lose so much in experiment two because the variance is higher. Okay, so this is how to systematically make use of the expected value or the mean and the variance analysis. Okay, now. Taking stock of that, remembering that, and consider, for example, this particular concept of the mean and variance in being able to make a, a systematic decision, an informed decision in the various level of managerial decisions involving 
imperfect information or incomplete in, imperfect or uh, uncertain information. <coughs> well, now, <coughs> we now see how the present how the presence of uncertainty uncertainty affects economic decision. A while ago, the discussion about the risk and the uh, uh, discussion about the variance and mean unexpected value, it's actually uh, a, a method or an approach that will address on uncertainty the effects to managerial decisions. Okay, we use the variance and the mean or mean on main variance analysis. Now, uncertainty is one side of the I know uncertainty is one side of the uh, analysis. The other side is about risk. Okay, about risk. Now, risk in the in information economics language is actually represented by or uh, captured by the probability of occurrence. That is the surrogate value of risk. But when you include that in the analysis, you now have to make a quantification in terms of the level of risk this time. Now, before we do some quantification or analysis, we might as well, it might profit us to also understand what are the risk-bearing tendencies of managers in the entire dynamics of managerial decisions, okay? Now, there are three different risk aversion attitudes of managers. Okay, one is a manager could be risk averse or a manager could be risk loving or a manager could be what? Could be risk neutral, okay? If a, if a manager is risk neutral, that individual is indifferent between a risky prospect with an expected value and sure amount of a million pesos or PM, million, that is million pesos, okay? Now, a risk averse, ang gusto sa risk averse is sigurado or he is a person who is sigurista. He is very uh, allergic to risk. He cannot take that. So he might as well, like for example, uh, opt for a decision that will ensure that he gets a return. And one of that, one of this, uh, exa one of the examples would be if you are made to really uh, select between to invest in, for example, stock market or deposit your money in the bank with a sure interest that is going to accrue to you at the end of the year, a risk averse person would choose to deposit his money in the bank, not uh, play around with the uh, capital markets because the risk level there is high. The rate of return also is high, but he is not going to risk his money that way. Okay, that is a risk averse person. Now, a risk loving, okay, if we compare between depositing the money in the bank or really uh, uh, playing around or like uh, uh, taking chances in the capital markets or in the stock market, for example, on the equity market, that particular person, if it is a risk loving uh, lover, would somehow you know, uh, choose to be in the stock market rather than depositing his money in the bank okay because he is not he is not afraid of risk he is going to uh, really uh, risk his money and uh, take chances to get high return also of his money but a risk neutral okay is something different if we look at his risk aversion tendency he is neutral he he i know he understands that there is a risk but somehow put some kind of analysis on how to circumvent that risk so that he's going to be able to get a, a good return for his money. He also considers a sure thing, but he also look at, compare that taking chances for this level, part of, a particular level of risk, given that he has enough information or depositing his money in the bank, he would rather do some analysis and eventually choose for a better return to his capital as long as that level of risk how up to a certain tolerance level that he could take the rate of return for that would be higher than a sure thing option okay risk neutral 
Okay, so we will uh, look at the the differences in terms of risk aversion tendency as we go on. Okay, now take some specific example. No? If we take some specific example on product quality, okay, or product quality, a risk averse person, person no? managerial decision involving involving risk averse consumer, okay. Dain daghan kayo nga risk averse consumer. Di mo balhin og lain nga detergent, di mo balhin og lain nga nga restaurant kay dihar or di mo balhin og any ano any uh, any new product. Uh, di mo balhin og anything. Ayaw niya talagang committed siya doon because he has this experience also. Now, manager decisions with risk averse consumer. <coughs> Unang una <coughs> for a risk averse consumer on product quality how a consumer risk averse consumer decides on product quality one is consumers prefer a sure thing than an uncertain prospect of equal expected value okay what is that no the the decision uh, logic here is risk averse consumer prefers a sure thing to an uncertain prospect of equal expected value. <coughs> uh, you are, for example, uh, using brand X. So, you are really, your product is really brand X. Here is brand Y. Here is brand Y. Trying to say uh, also much powerful or much uh, efficient also, or equally efficient than your product, your brand X. <coughs> More often than not, it is really very difficult to convince the consumer or the customer to shift to a new product. Buying a new laundry detergent is a challenge <coughs> to make a consumer think that the expected quality of a new product is higher than certain quality of the old product. So, what is now your strategy there? So, to be able to crack, make a crack on the risk aversion tendency, there are all sorts of strategies, like <coughs> you offer an introductory price, or maybe you provide quantity discount, many other, many other strategies, such that you can create a dent on his being risk averse, and to eventually coax him to transfer to a new product or to opt for a new product. And that is going to be a challenge, okay? Now, another thing is still on product quality, but on what? On, uh, like, for example, uh, like, uh, like food consuming, con consumption, food consumption. I'm, I'm, I'm specifically referring to, like, a restaurant, a restaurant. So in town, you have a favorite, a favorite restaurant, no? You have a favorite restaurant. Now, risk aversion also explains why it says here, it may be of the firm's interest to become part of the chain of store instead of remaining independent, okay? The key thing to notice is that <clears throat> even in local store offers a better product than the national chain, the national chain can remain in business. If there are, take note of this, if, out of town customer is large enough in that area okay okay something like this haven't you noticed when a small town who has a good restaurant and then uh you know also have some some kind of entertainment but that particular town is really confined to itself to its community people are uh have have a regular you know dynamics in terms of where to buy where to buy this kind of product where to buy this kind of <coughs> what where to buy this kind of like like food something like that in the community now if that particular community is confined to itself you wouldn't really expect that you know introducing or invest investors from other uh, you know, uh, areas would venture into selling something 
competing with the existing traditional product in that community community why because if you are a, a foreign entrant into that community you will be challenged with the risk aversion tendency people already know where to buy specific product that they are confident that the quality is really good and they are not in a position to risk themselves buying a new product and maybe experience a side effect or something like that okay they have all sorts of dynamics so that the thing here is they won't they don't they wouldn't dare to risk especially if a new entrant offers a higher price will not be that uh, easy now haven't you noticed also that in towns and even cities where there is a, there is constant throwing and throwing throwing and throwing of people throwing and throwing of people in other words strangers from other or uh, new people from other towns flock there and here and go there and there they, they change transaction and go back, go back to the respective places. There is a high probability that a an investor outside of the community will come in and survive in the process. Okay, why why do you think that, for example, Jollibee will not invest on an area, even how big is the area, but if they are only confined to their own community without, like for example out of town customers going into that area Jollibee will not venture to offer uh, their services in that area because people have already their their uh, for example have already their uh, commitment and also have already their own like uh, 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 say for example uh, dynamics in terms of where to buy certain product and they wouldn't risk transferring to another uh, say for example product no and comparing it with somebody who is you know an out of town customer you do not know where to get where to buy certain food where to buy certain product in that particular town for example where to buy pasalubong where to buy where to eat during last time you do not know exactly the dynamics in the town it would be beneficial for you to eat in the for example national chain store or highly recognized brand because the the assurance of risk is really very low meaning to say you are sure that this national brand or national chain like for example mcdonald's Jollibee, or what have you can give you uh there's a higher degree of say for example safe and hygienic uh, food quality okay you wouldn't experiment eating into a traditional restaurant in a place where you are an out of town customer diba? if you go to a new place and you can you cannot just experiment on eating the traditional restaurant around there because you do not know what they're offering you would rather eat into a recognized and familiar uh, chain of restaurant because you know that it is safe and that is exactly risk aversion tendency uh, dynamics of customers in product quality choice so we have that no that is the no that is the situation no so that it's it's really beneficial for a popular brand to enter into a certain uh, into a certain location and compete with the existing uh, enterprise there if that place has a constant towing and throwing of people in and out in and out for certain reasons and purpose pero kung ang community is only confined among themselves they wouldn't do there to invest in that area okay <clears throat> in fact Jollibee has a an indicator uh, i know that from one of my classmates in, in up they have an indicator whether they are there is a signal that will it, it's okay to invest in that location and very and, and very uh uh like i would say unrelated indicator but according to that uh, person that the manager of one of Jollibee's outlet the presence of micro of mercury drug okay the presence of mercury drug 
if Mercury that survives at that particular location, that is one of their indicator na Jollibee can also survive. I don't know the reason, but that's what she said. But I can only surmise that the the presence of Mercury Dog also, if they survive, there they become profitable. Their customer also is not only coming from that particular uh, shall we say town. There will be a lot of out of town customers. So that that could be the reason why, if there are a lot of out of town customers going to Mercury, now these people also would like to buy on this, uh, for example, uh, Jollibee food products because they don't trust the they don't trust the local restaurant because they're not so familiar with the hygienic practice or whatever quality requirements is there. You know? So that's that's something. You know? That's product quality. Another is individuals also choose to buy insurance for their homes and automobiles. By buying, still on product quality, by buying insurance, individuals give up a small portion of their potential loss, an amount of money to eliminate risk associated with catastrophic loss no so that means to say you are you are paying something that will minimize the risk of catastrophic loss of certain damage to your car or certain damage to life or injury no so that if you have that you become a little bit uh, already confident because without that insurance, you wouldn't dare like uh, driving or like uh, uh, taking a ride to a particular uninsured vehicle. No? For all you know, there might be something that's going to happen and then you, you, you wouldn't be indemnified. So something like that. No? Now, going a little further, we also have consumer, risk averse consumer in searching for product quality. But the, let's go to the theoretical scaffold in terms of the dynamics of consumer search. You know? Managerial decision with risk averse consumer. But what is the theory behind you know, uh, governing consumer search? Okay? Suppose consumers do not know the prices charged by different stores for some homogeneous commodity. Okay? The same commodity, you do not know how much is the. You know, uh, the price charged by different stores, diba? You go from one store to another, and who offers a better price? Who offers the lowest price? You buy the same product in that store. No? Logically, the third bullet: a consumer would like to purchase the product from a store charging the lowest price. Okay, <clears throat> from a store charging the lowest price. That is why we make some canvas here and there, going from one store to another. Even, for example, if you go to Divisoria, you uh, hop from one store to another. Whoever offers the, the better price or lowest price, you buy there. That is assuming that the location of all your options are within striking distance. What about if there is another requirement that would enable you? Maybe you will take a uh, I know you will take a a, a, a little ride and, and something like that just to be hopping from one store to another and that that will differentiate in other words that will make a difference in terms of your consumer averse uh, kind of risk averse uh, decision or for consumer search now in terms of the theoretical scaffolds or theoretical basis of that <coughs> Consumer decides the optimal, what is optimal to him or to her, no? what is optimal. In other words, if you do consumer search, okay, for example, if this is the price, okay, if this is the price, now, price level, this one is expected benefit and cost. So, expected benefit and cost. Okay. In other words, the uh, cost plus benefit, this one. Okay. You have the expected benefit has 
this particular almost like a marginal cost curve okay and then you have the cost of doing consumer search okay <clears throat> now if you do consumer search consumer actually decides to buy a certain product for so long as the expected benefit is what is equal to the expected cost for example if the, you, you buy that particular product and then the expected benefit is you gain a discount for example a, a discount of 20 pesos okay you get a discount of 20 pesos but you're to do that certain hopping or canvassing from that point to that point would also cost you another 20 pesos or maybe 25 pesos if you take a taxi for example no way you wouldn't dare to to buy that product if you if your expected cost is already higher than the expected uh, benefit okay so that means to say your your uh what your expected decision should always be or your cut off uh say point for that decision is at the equality between expected cost and expected benefit or from our previous lesson this is actually another simplification of the concept of marginal cost and marginal benefit okay so that if marginal cost is higher than marginal benefit continue the search that means you are still here continue continue the search but when, it, when you arrive at this particular point that means to say your what your marginal cost just compensates your marginal uh, benefit then you make a buy that is the, the maximum uh, point okay so that means to say if uh you if the if the price is here so that means to say your marginal your marginal cost is here that means your marginal benefit is lower than if the if you are at this particular if you are at this particular point your marginal benefit is actually lower okay than your marginal uh, cost which means you don't need to buy that particular product okay uh, i'm going to give you a concrete example this one what time i think i have I, I don't know if i have given you this example already but it happens like this no <coughs> we were traveling <coughs> our research team we were taking a a vehicle flying the road from the Bow city to butuan city by land by land no? we have we use an suv take the road then one of my friend told me that because he is a tagalog speaking uh, person na miss ko na ang dorian i want to buy dorian no? i want to eat tapos uh the price here in davao is like uh, 55 or 60 pesos per kilo medyo mahal yata uh, then okay try natin sa panabo baka mura doon travel to panabo then when we reach panabo it's 55 pesos that's a five pesos difference so ingon siya alam mo mas mura sa tagum sigurado kasi mas malayo na yun eh. so the red swimming tagum tagum when we reach tagum after one hour no i mean maybe less than one hour from panabo when we reach tagum the price there was like 52 51 51 something like that per kilo per kilo and there in fact they're not by 50 and then one of my companion sigurado when we reach Moncayo, it's already very cheap because in Moncayo, that is the boundary of agusan and uh, Dabo, Dabo del norte so it's going to be cheaper there in Moncayo. so we drive continue to drive expecting that it's going to be cheaper in Moncayo. wow to our amazement to our shock the price in Mungkayo is 70 pesos per kilo. <laughs> we were looking at each other. We were staring at each other. So, where do we, we can, how can we eat durian here? We might as well buy the durian at 70 pesos per kilo. 
than going back to Tagong, can you imagine? So the consumer search, we should have been more systematic in that way. No? So in, that, in other words, when you reach Moncayo, the expected benefit is already very, is already lower than the, than the uh, cost of really uh, doing consumer search. In fact, the price is already expensive in 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 uh, Mungkayo. so that means we have we, we 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 thought that we only have regrets that like we we should have bought the durian in in panabo in that case we, we wouldn't be having some regrets eating the durian in Mungkayo at 70 pesos per kilo something like that no so we run uh short of the analytical or the more systematic way of deciding that it's better to buy in Panabo than incurring additional time and fuel expense going to Mongkayo when the price there is already very high. No? So that's that's essentially an application of this particular concept. No? So continue, we have to be very careful about deciding where to buy after doing canvas. If we factor in, no, if we factor in the search cost associated by in doing that for example moving from one store to another i would rather buy here than i know uh, than uh, spending effort and time etc to go to a particular uh, place supposedly offering a cheaper price but when you factor everything into the buying process it it uh, sums up or it comes up with like it's more expensive because you are expending a lot of things, effort and time and money just to buy the thing. It seems to be very cheap. But you know what? I think that is more applicable to uh, men buying behavior because there are really there are really peculiarities among women also. that They don't care about the effort for as long as it appears to be cheap, even if like a uh, few pesos difference only. They don't care about the, you know, the hassle and bustle of <coughs> going from one place to another, and be, uh, uh, they become infused already. They become satisfied to really think about. They have made a, a a bargain in the process. When you factor in everything, maorang gihapon, one expensive pangani kay you you feel tired already of doing the canvas. So that's that's uh, some. One peculiarity, but to be rational about it, we have to, to compute, we have to incorporate all associated cash and non cash costs in the process. No? Now, the consumer search rule from that particular graph is that search for a better price with the price charged by the firm is above the reservation price. Okay? The above the reservation price you charge uh, <coughs> search for a better price kung ang imong reservation price no meaning to say willingness to pay taas taas pa kaysa imong reservation <coughs> price then mo ngita pa ka until finally that the 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 search or the price is already below the reservation price or the katong C then you make a buy already it's no longer uh, economical to continue the search. Okay. Now, let's go back to the uncertainty and the firm. Previously, we have discussed how uncertainty affects consumer behavior, thus creating a direct impact on the nature of demand. Uh, uncertainty also affects the manager's input and output decision. It is therefore important to pinpoint the impact of uncertainty to highlight its direct influence on managerial decisions okay so let's say for example like risk aversion tendency under uncertainty uh, using this concept of uncertainty and the firm kanina uncertainty and risk aversion tendency with the consumer this time uncertainty and the firm Okay, now let's take for example risk aversion uh, attitude or tendency. <clears throat> a risk averse manager 
may prefer a risky project with an expected return of 1 million pesos and a certain return of 1 million pesos. The risk averse manager will prefer a sure thing. Hindi makagustong risk. So, kanag yung sigurado. No? Kung naapay risk associated with that, hindi na siya gusto. Kanto yung sigurado nga, certain yun. Bahala na gamay rag uh, uh, ano, return. No? While a risk neutral manager is interested in maximizing expected profit, variance of the profit does not affect risk neutral managers. The decision is the expected value is high after considering all risk. Okay? Ngunit kita na sa sa manager. No? Na ay risk, taas pag-expect, he's able to manage that particular risk, then the risk neutral manager will go for that. While a risk taker, no way. How, though how much <coughs> risky it is for as long as it is also high return, he will venture into it. No? That is a risk taker manager. So risk lover manager. Now, whenever a manager faces a decision to choose among risky projects, it is important to carefully evaluate the risk and expected return of the project. And then document this evaluation and see on say imo pili on the decision. Let's take for example this one. No, <coughs> no in a short while. A manager is least less likely to get fired over a bad outcome. No? Risky prospects may result to bad outcome. Of die risk, there is a probability of having a bad outcome. But if you are a manager, a manager is less likely to get fired over a bad outcome if he or she provides evidence that based on the information available at the time the decision was made, the decision was sound. What is that? If you hire a manager and the manager is risk, for example, uh, like for example, risk averse, meaning to say, mahadlok og risk, that manager is not fitted to be a manager. Why? <coughs> <clears throat> because the owners, the stockholders, and the the investors in that particular business are already risk averse, and here you are a manager. You are also a risk averse. You are you have, you don't have any business managing the asset of the company because you will end up nothing because you are uh, very coward. That's why you are hired a manager because you have the ability and the capacity to manage risk. That's why the most appropriate manager must be a risk neutral. But how do we know that a manager is a risk neutral? He provides a justification on how to deal with risk. Okay, dili lang hamag hamag lang, no? A manager that provides a justification that we can manage this risk and we can get this level of return, and then present that to the board or to the stockholders, and everybody says, "Yeah, I think that is logical," so we venture on that. Well, that is a that is a characteristic, a very characteristic of a manager. But if your manager is very uh, risk averse, very uncharacteristic to be a manager. Okay, that is something. That is what we mean by this particular uh, logic of a, uh, for example, uncertainty and the firm. No? Now, illustrative problem. Okay, the problem here is. A risk averse manager is considering two projects. Remember, a risk averse manager considering two projects. First project involves expanding project A. Okay, expand project A. Then the second involves expanding market for project B. Okay, there is a 10% chance of recession. Okay, now I Economy, there's a 10% chance of recession and 90% chance of economic boom or favorable economic situation. During a boom or favorable situation, Project A will lose 10,000, whereas Project B will earn 20,000. Okay, during a boom. During a recession, 
Project A earn 12,000 and Project B will lose 8,000. Okay, those are the payoff in all events happening. Okay. If the alternative earning is 3,000 on a safe asset, say treasury bill, what should the manager do? Okay. These are the, if we dichotomize the problem, two options, project A and project B, or two, two projects he is going to make a decision. The first project involves expanding market for project A. Second is expanding market for project B. But the question is, when you expand market, there is 10% chance of recession and 90% chance of economic boom. Now, I boom, project will lose 10,000, project A, whereas project B will earn 20,000. During a recession, it will also have the, ano. remember, for a recession and the boom, the probability of occurrence. If there is a probability of occurrence, and there is also a, what? A uh, payoff for every event happening orally, mentally, in the, or in your mind, you can compute for the expected value of a of the expected value that you can expect from each project, project A and B, given boom and like recession happening. Okay, and then there is also another alternative aside from project A or project being a. 3,000 on a safe asset or deposit, he gets 3,000, whether there is a boom or uh, or a recession, 3,000, safe deposit asset. What should the manager do? So what is the, what is the, I know, what is, how do we go about solving the, the problem? Thing to do is lay down what is the situation. Arrange them in a matrix form. You have option a or project a this is boom this is recession and then project b this is uh, boom column and this is the recession column so you have sorry you have 90 percent chance okay you have 90 percent chance of a boom and 10 percent chance of a recession so right away you can compute for the expected value right that one for each entry in the column times the probability and sum you get this uh, no, mean value and so on and in fact you can also compute for the standard deviation whatever is the expected value it's random variable minus the expected value the resulting value here and then uh, after that uh, you get what uh, you get uh, you add also the expected value for this uh, uh, the, the variance here and then get the standard deviation get the square root you can uh, you can actually use the formula and then uh, plot that in this column okay so completing all those uh, say operations you get this particular table populated now this one this the the entry and the standard deviation is actually the the surrogate value for the variance because it is just the, the square root of the variance okay so that means you have what computed expected value and then you have this particular uh, no, uh say for example uh say for example uh, options no? <coughs> joint investment you have here and then you have treasury bill also okay this, these are the the different projects no the different projects so if you are a risk averse <coughs> if you are a risk averse remember this is the expected uh, return this column the mean column is the expected return this is the degree of risk okay the degree of uh, risk involved so that means to say if you are a risk averse uh, person what will what will you do if you are a risk averse uh, person you would what you would decide on okay you would decide on just buying a treasury bill sigurado ng 3000 okay risk free di ba sa gusto ug risk so ug risk averse 
Diri nasya sa treasury bill, treasury bill na wala niya hago, 3,000 ako after, no? Now you will notice that uh, you have boom and bash, or boom and recession, 3,000 and then siyempre, 3,000 na naman iyang ikaw ang gineposit. So, 3,000 na po niya expected value. <coughs> that is if you are a risk averse. What about if you are what? If you are a, a what? A uh, risk neutral. Okay? If you are a risk neutral, what will you do? Okay? What will you do if you are a risk neutral? You would be going for an investment. If you are a risk neutral, remember a risk neutral entertains a certain degree of risk. Okay? And trying to say manage the, I know, the, say, uh, the, the risk according to available information and select the the what the uh, for example the option investment option where he can get the maximum benefit given the risk associated also is uh, going to uh, minimize the risk so it could be like given the available information he does not also want to lose in the process <coughs> <clears throat> now, he would rather choose, for example, a joint like investment, or for example, if uh, for example, if like uh, uh, he's going to have some additional information and is able to manage for the risk associated in option B, he might also go to option B. But more often than not, entertaining a certain degree of risk, he would the risk neutral manager would choose on investing. Uh, uh, joint investment, no? so that is uh, also one option. But a risk averse, or a risk lover, to ana siya on as a higher risk, higher return, ato na ang ato na mupili ang risk lover. No? But a risk averse, arin asya na trace rebuild. Idi posit nila na usbang ko eh, kay mas sigurado pa ang mga parta, pagkinaunsa ang economy. Logical, but risk averse also is like that also so many managers are risk averse generally the owners of the firm stockholders want managers to behave in a risk neutral manner a manager who is risk neutral cares only about the expected value and of a risky project not the underlying task okay a risk neutral okay a risk neutral manager would choose a risky action over a sure thing provided the expected profit of the risky prospect exceeded those the sure thing. Okay? May isid lang na siya sa sure thing. Just like, for example, <coughs> uh, 9,000 is kuan, higher than 3,000. Pwede na na sa risk neutral manager. No? So, that is how a risk neutral manager would go. For as long as and rate of return will exceed the uh, safe or sure thing and wala do kay risk nga gi entertain uh, that is the way to go when you are a risk neutral okay now uh, again furthermore kanina consumer search karon producer search if a consumer search for stores charging low prices produce produ producer search for low prices of inputs also when there is uncertainty regarding the prices of inputs, optimizing firm employment or optimal search strategy. Note, however, that for a risk neutral manager, the optimal search strategy will be precisely the same as that of the risk neutral consumers, uh, consumer. No? Okay, so that means to say the the basis of decision for a producer search is actually the same as the basis of decision for uh, consumer search okay because a producer can also be a consumer at the same time when he buys input for production okay <coughs> take this for example as one example a producer or an, an a firm will buy an input say labor okay recruit somebody this is an illustrative problem suppose half of the workers in the labor market 
assemble ito for possible interview, are willing to work for a salary of 40,000. Half also, or 50% also, accepts a salary of 38,000 only. The manager spends three hours interviewing a given worker, marami no? A given worker, and values his time at 300. Okay? Spends three hours, values its time, his time at 300. The worker and the manager interviews, interviews says, he will work only. For, I mean, first the worker, the first worker rather, the first worker, the manager interviews, says he will work only if paid 40,000. Okay? Now, sila, na ay gusto mo work of 40,000, na apoy 38,000. Okay na sila si 38,000. But, there is 50-50 chance. Uh, ano? work if you i know if you interview you have a a cost of three thousand or three hundred if per interview that means uh you have to see if you interview somebody and if it happens to be like gusto rasya forty thousand should the firm manager or should the firm firm's manager Make, an, make him an offer to work or interview another. Okay? Okay, first interview, we come. Interview, interview. How much salary do you want? Ingot siya. 40,000 ang gusto. 40,000? Well, qualified ka. But let me see. If we get you, and then, or maybe we will interview another. So you have, you have to have some basis, systematic basis whether to forego this particular worker and interview another okay so what's what's the solution how are you going to go go about it no so the problem has a search cost remember the solution steps no the problem has a search cost of 300 pesos if the manager search for another worker half of the time she will work she is willing to work 38000 thus he will save 2000 but half also of the time the manager will find a worker just like one she chooses not to hire 40000 good and the effort will have been for nothing thus the expected benefit of interviewing another is that one this one this is the expected benefit of interviewing another one okay because when you interview another one, the, for example, the, the one that, if, if it comes out to be, okay, ra siya, og, kanabang 38,000, so you save 2,000. This one. You save this amount. But what about, kung 40,000, no? so you have nothing, no savings at all, so you get the expected value, the expected value is 1,000. Okay? In other words, the expected value is 1,000 if you interview another. Now, the question is, are you going to interview another one? How are you going to uh, make a decision? Now, simple. The expected value, okay? The expected value is 1,000. Okay, the expected value. In other words, the expected value of the benefit. Okay, the mean benefit is one thousand, but your cost is only three hundred. The your time spent in interviewing. Obviously, the decision is interview another one. Okay, until finally, na ang imong expected value is already lower than the uh, expected cost, or the expected benefit is already lower than three hundred. Out. Oh. That is something that you, know, uh, you stop interviewing, okay? You stop interviewing because that is, you know, that, that is already very costly. So, since 1,000 is greater than search cost of 300, the manager should not hire the first 
uh, worker interviewed instead searched for another worker who might be willing to work at 38,000. That's the application there. No? Very importantly, you have to weigh the expected value and the and compare it with the you no, know, with the uh, for example uh, additional cost involved. So this particular concept of expected value in a risk neutral manager manager very applicable also to a uh, risk to profit maximization. The risk neutral manager must determine what output to produce before C is certain. This means that to maximize expected profit, the manager should what? Equate expected marginal revenue with expected marginal cost or with, with mar marginal cost setting an output level. Okay? Now in in a particular I know, firm situation, revenue is random or uncontrollable than cost. Diba? You can make some cost control, but you cannot make a control of revenue because revenue is out there in the market. You don't need, you cannot control that. There are a lot of situations uh, that is going to happen or that are, that are, that you are, that you will be facing. So in other words, in, in situation where there is uncertainty faced by the firm in the, you know, in the market, in the buying behavior of the firm in the market, you have to get the expected revenue and compare it with the expected cost. That is what we are we have actually uh, used in the previous example. The expected MR, the expected value of benefit is should be equal to or equal, equal to or should be greater than or equal to marginal cost or MR is equals to MC. That is the optimum level of decision. Okay, so that is uh, how to make use of that. No? In here, we see that when we when manager is risk neutral, okay, as we have said, as I as I will also emphasize, a manager should be risk neutral. When you talk about manager standard rational thinking or assumption that the manager should be risk neutral. Dili pwede ng manager nga, risk averse or risk taker. No? He should be risk neutral because a manager makes or manages the risk in an informed manner. No? Nagin na siya, mabitong manager na siya, kay he needs to calculate how to deal with the possibility of risk. Okay? Now, here, th those are the situation between producer and the consumer in the buy in their buying behavior in the in the market in searching for the best option <clears throat> now we will go into the uncertainty and the market kanina uncertainty and the consumer the next is uncertainty and the firm or the producer now uncertainty and the market naana po sa market uncertainty and the market okay now uncertainty in the market is actually best described by market asymmetry in other words the market is characterized by asymmetric information in other words imperfect information okay a situation that exists when some people have a better information than others maybe the buyers or the yeah, well the buyers have a better information than the than the, than the sellers or maybe the sellers has much better information than the, than the buyers. Imperfect, very asymmetric. Asymmetry of information between consumers and the firm can affect, affect firm profit. Okay? Because whoever is, whoever, where the asymmetric information is skewed to, it will incur disadvantageous uh, market transaction. This creates market uncertainty when there is imperfect information okay now imperfect information also okay since it creates market asymmetry there are different ways different examples of 
market asymmetry in the market. Okay, a firm is selling a new product, which is good, but the consume the customer do not know the cons the consumer. But the, the customer do not know the consumer will not buy. Okay. In other words, you are selling something good quality, but you are not able to communicate this good quality of your product to the customer. So it's just not normal. The customer will not buy, especially if the willingness to pay is very, very, very low. But if they are convinced of the quality, they understand your product, that is going to convince the customer to make a final buy of your product or they will take a look at second look at your product so the the thing there is there should be transparency of information but more often than not market is not going into the uh, line of trajectory the rational behavior of person is to make a kill make a profit in every transaction now if they can be in a position, advantageous position, at the expense of another, that will always, that can happen actually. Only in a very, you know, well-regulated and arbitrated market dynamics where there is level playing field. But you have to be prepared on the playing field in the market where the field is not level. There is imperfect information. Now, Manifestation of imperfect information. Okay, the manifestation of imperfect information. One is hidden characteristics or ability. Things one party to a transaction knows about itself, but which are unknown to the other party. Okay? You are about to enter into a contract. Maybe you are going to borrow money in the bank. So, how will the bank know that you are going to pay your loan or not? How will the bank know that? So in other words, you, you might appear to be very decent and uh, rational person. So, but your characteristic, kung maayba ka mabayad or dili, is hidden to the, to the bank. So that is one hidden characteristic. Or maybe you approach a you approach an interview the firm will would like to hire you but what you are uh what you are really a bad employee or employer an employee you know? meaning to say you are so lazy or maybe you are prone to absenteeism or you are always late or something like that. These are not known during the time that you were hired. No? Another characteristic of hidden information or shall I say market asymmetry when there is hidden effort or hidden characteristic. Okay, you are hired. You seem to be a very nice person. You are hired and your diploma says that you are really good and you come from a, the, a good school. Then you are taken in. But there is still one thing that is lacking, which one party in a relationship cannot observe by the other. What about workers' effort or your ability to produce or really to, to, to exert your best potential? That is not known in the ano. Maybe you work there and then uh, you consume the time or you finish the time in one day but you don't finish the work in one day why because you only give like not the optimal effort that you are expected to effort is difficult very difficult to know you are there present maybe you also do the same you follow everything but there is something in you that you can probably do and yet you are inhibited from doing it because of some problem so that is a hidden action or hidden effort, and that is, you know, that is, uh, that makes everything symmetric. Now the challenge there is how to draw that out, how to allow that, how to uh, factor that out into the employer-employee relationship. In that, in the final end, you will end out or you will end up to be a very productive person, and. 
the cost of hiring you is very uh, advantageous. But it needs a careful strategy. No? Now, the other uh, problem in market, like uh, remember, it's a problem on the, uh, the uh, it's in, in asymmetric information, it could be hidden effort or hidden action. Okay, okay. If we go back a little bit, hidden characteristic rather and hidden action. Okay, characteristic, good or bad, or hidden action, effort, best effort, or not so best effort, something like that. So that is the manifestation of imperfect information. Now, in the actual situation, what are the types of information asymmetry? Different types <coughs> manifestation in the actual like uh, market dynamics. What the first time first selection where individuals hide information. They apply for a job, and then when they get the job, I mean, they, I know, when they uh, like present, I mean, go for interview, they present a fake diploma. Oh, that is a problem. You will end up, you will adversely suffer when you are not able to discern which one is fake, which one is a good diploma. <coughs> that means to say that person is hiding his characteristic, which is very undesirable. You will end up doing adverse selection. You will end up hiring somebody, undesirable employers, employees. So that's why it is valid that where do you, from what school do you came, do you, uh, you came from, and then uh, what, what, how, what is your grade or something like that. That is just to avoid adverse selection. Okay, <coughs> at least to make sure uh, that you have hired a, a qualified. <coughs> individuals okay that is one one problem we have to really be careful about adverse selection because uh, people can really hide the characteristic okay they can even hide their characteristic by appearing to be very knowledgeable of a lot of things but you have to have a diagnostic uh, test in order to see whether his fluency in the language also is equal to his fluency in the skills. That's a different thing. So something like this. So we need to minimize, if not avoid, adverse selection. The other one under mark in imperfect market information is you have, well, before that, the, an example of adverse selection is, like, for example, good in licensing drivers, good or bad driver are going to, let the bad drivers pay for a higher or no it's not possible are you going to uh, give a cheaper licensing fee for good drivers it's not possible you have to have a standardized test in order to like uh, uh, discriminate people who are faking their skills than those who are true to their skills okay that is adverse uh, uh, selection so the other type of like uh, Market asymmetry is moral hazard. Okay, moral hazard is not other, but where one party to a contract takes hidden action this time. His character, his characteristic is good, maayusya, very qualified, but he takes, he hides his action or effort that benefits him or her at the expense of another party or at the expense of the company. Hiring a manager with fixed salary, example, fixed salary. A fixed salary, a fixed for the young effort. In other words, it's a question of incentivizing the whole relationship such that the best potential of that person will really come out, drawing from him that best effort through a particular strategy of really uh, allowing him to work in the environment. Okay? So th that is something else, no? something very important. Another is parental insurance or parental. I one time I I I, know, I uh, uh, rented a motorcycle in which I, I went to Dan Bantai Bantayan Island and then I, I I'm going to visit uh, students doing their field practice in uh, many livestock 
uh, enterprise there like poultry and swine. So I need to visit, move around the island and visit all those different uh, companies operating either piggery or uh, no, uh, poultry, uh, poultry or layer uh, enterprise. So I rented a motorcycle. I cannot do that through uh, uh, a public conveyance because public conveyance would uh, really cannot get inside interior destinations. So I rented a what a uh, a motorcycle. I was the first user, but you know what? the The rent is what the rent is five hundred per day. Okay, five hundred per day. But the assurance money is like. 5,000, 5,000 or 3,000. There's a money assurance, a guarantee that we can, you can use this at 500 pesos. In fact, that was only like 450 pesos a day. Econ, if you will, the, your, the fuel will be yours. But only for the, you, you pay 500 pesos. But you have a, 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 a guarantee money of 3,000. Why? Because if there is something that will happen to the vehicle, maybe you there are scratches or damage because you are very careless you are a bad driver for example that five that five thousand or three thousand pesos depending on the assessment will not be returned to you but if you are very careful about using it then the three thousand will go back to you at the end of the day so that is something that will coax or will encourage people to give their best effort in using the the motorcycle or the vehicle otherwise they will be it will be used carelessly anyway that the, the rent is just very cheap and that is not a good motivator the motivator there is the guarantee money if you make a damage that is more than three thousand your three thousand will, uh, will not be returned to you and they will still collect to you to pay for the damage aside from the uh, rent of the uh, daily rent of the vehicle so that's that's to avoid moral hazard in the transaction okay and a different thing in thailand for example in thailand you have they will allow you to rent the money or rent the vehicle either car or i know either car or motorcycle but you have to leave your passport with them okay you have to leave your passport because otherwise when they when you return and you have a lot of damage in the in your ano you will in the in the, in the vehicle you will be compelled to pay otherwise your passport will not be returned so very clever no so that's a way an example of minimizing moral hazard in business transactions and it can be applied to various other uh, market relationships okay the last but not the least is signaling or screening it's a problem of making common basis of measurement no? common basis of measurement that somehow will discriminate those that are very uncharacteristic and those that are you know with bad effort but the thing is how are you going to do that how are you going to tangibilize the intangible characteristics and effort of the of the one uh, selling of the of the one selling or offering his service to you to be a worker no how are you going to tangibilize the intangibles now one very good example is that's why when you apply for a job they will always be particular about your first from what school did you graduate okay so if you are a graduate of top school you have been sure already a high percentage of getting hired then they will look at your grades then you will look at their other your other credentials or maybe experience factoring everything together then they are at least able to tangibilize the intangible characteristics and effort from you. And finally, they will make a say, you are hired or you are sorry, you look for another, I don't, uh, maybe we can, you can, you can be best fitted for uh, some other, you know, company, but not in this company because uh, we are looking for other characteristics best suited to the demands of the work, something like that. No? So, these are going to create a signal. Or are, if, are you a TESDA uh, holder of a uh, NC2 or NC3 or NC4? Now, that NC, okay, competency, is a signal 
is an indication that you possess the necessary competency to suit the job because that one is an accredited the one that gives you the in situ or national competency skills the one that accredits you that is also a recognized accrediting agency and it's also a good basis of really trying to say you have the skill required for the job okay so it's, it, it really discriminates those who are qualified and those who are not and it discriminates also at least the attitude and the uh, characteristics of the worker something like that signaling and screening sometimes diploma is good sometimes other uh, other factors maybe the skills required okay because if they only completely trust on diploma diploma can be fake this time that's why there's a way of really making sure the certainty the genuine genuine uh, there is a technology that is used by uh, many agencies or schools to make sure that the diploma that they are uh, that they produce is not a fake one but an authentic uh, kind of one so remember the pro the manifestations of imperfect information in the market either a adverse election moral hazard or uh, the, the problem of the signaling okay, or screening okay so these are the these are the uncertainties in the market and in the that affects consumer affects the producer and affects the market also which in in return affects the uh, uh, the entrepreneur being able to raise a desirable level of profit so thank you and i would say uh with all those ideas make good ideas happen whenever possible thank you and have a good day